Asato ma sadgamaya, tamaso ma jyotirgamaya, mrityur ma amritam gamaya, om shanti shanti shanti. Om, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness unto light, lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. Good morning. This morning, the subject of the lecture, Seeing God in Everything, is actually based upon a talk which Swami Vivekananda gave in 1896 in London, which forms part of um, his Jnana Yoga, the lecture series on the way of knowledge, Jnana Yoga. Um, so seeing God in, in everyone, or seeing God everywhere, that was the original uh, talk. And the talk is based on the Isha Upanishad. So this, today's talk forms a part of a series of um, talks which we are having on Swami Vivekananda's Jnana Yoga. So Swami Vivekananda, of course, he is the founder of this Vedanta society, the first of the Vedanta societies. But his uh, approach to Vedanta was unique and powerful and modern. So it deserves to be, we, we, we should focus upon it um, directly. That's the purpose of this lecture series. In this talk, Swami Vivekananda begins with the most obvious problem of life, that we suffer. Suffering, he calls it the problem of evil, or in Indian terms, dukkha, suffering. And that seems to be a constant uh, condition of life. You overcome one type of suffering, either that one comes back again or something else comes. And there is physical suffering, there is mental suffering. There are problems in families, in societies, in nations. There are problems with our natural environment. Um, global warming is, our, is the problem of our day. So all of these problems, we suffer, and we try to solve it in worldly ways. Religion offers us a solution. Religion comes along and says that there is an ultimate reality beyond this world of suffering. Try to get that, realize that, find that, attain that, and you will go beyond suffering. Some call it God, some call it Allah, some call it Jehovah. In Vedanta, it is called Brahman. So there is, religion offers a, suffer, a, a solution to suffering. In fact, this is a common promise of all religions. You attain nirvana, moksha, salvation, whatever it is called in the different religious traditions. But the common factor is you go beyond worldly suffering. But then Swami Vivekananda points out, this doesn't, is not really a solution at all. When you look closely, what it seems to say is, here is this world, there are problems in this world, give up this world and attain something called God. So this world with which we is, is so real to us, in fact, is the only reality to us. It seems we are being asked to give this up for some vague promise, for something that we take on faith that is not yet real to us. I know it. Um, God might be a reality to Sri Ramakrishna or to the saints and sages of different religions, but to me right now it's something, it's a matter of faith or it's a matter of, um, of, uh, of a belief system or philosophy. Whereas this world presented by the senses seems to be very real. And he tells the funny story of um, a man who was being troubled by a mosquito. And his friend came to help him and gave, him, gave the poor man such a blow that it did kill the mosquito, but it killed the man too. <laughs> <laughs> and he says uh, that religion seems to be offering such a solution. Um, if you look closely at it, what is being demanded, all that seems to be fun, you give that up. Sometimes they say eat healthy and one, one characteristic of healthy food is it, it should not be tasty. It's not true. Healthy food can be very tasty, but that seems to be the general idea. So if you're religious and spiritual, you cannot have fun in the world. And that's the general idea of religion across the different traditions. 
Uh, whether it's here, the moment you hear somebody is a regular churchgoer and very seriously interested in practicing um, his faith, you immediately get the idea of a sour-faced person who is not interested in being interesting and fun and so on. In India, if somebody becomes very interested in religion and spirituality, they'll immediately say, oh, you're going to become a monk? You're going to go away to the mountains? That's the general idea, that somehow you're going away from life. Arjuna had the same idea in the Bhagavad Gita when he decided that these worldly pursuits are not for him. So he wanted to give it all up and go away. Of course, Krishna persuaded him otherwise. So what is the secret of religion? Swami Vivekananda says there, the religions of the world are right, but the way it is presented does not quite appeal to our uh, our reason. It seems like an unreasonable demand. What should be there is a religion which is equally heart and head, reason and feeling. And then Swami Vivekananda says, I would beg to state that Vedanta is the rational religion for this age. What Vedanta says will be acceptable to the rational minds of this age. <clears throat> Before I go on, let me just say, when I read that, I was reminded of Einstein. You know, a letter he wrote to one Eric Gutkind or Gutkind was sold last year. You know, Christie's, the auction house, they sold that letter for $2.9 million. And what's in that letter? Um, Eric Gutkind, I, I researched this. He was a Jewish philosopher and a Jewish teacher in the early 20th, mid 20th century. He wrote a book, a number of books, one of which about, was about a new presentation of the Jewish faith. And he sent a copy to Einstein, who was in Princeton at that time, in 1952-53 here. And Einstein read that book. And he wrote back to Eric um, Gutkind. He says, in that letter he says, I consider the word of God to be nothing other than a collection of human weaknesses. To me, it goes on. But the basic thing he says at the end, to me the Jewish faith along with all other religions, is a collection of childish superstitions. He says that. So does that mean Einstein was atheist? Not at all. He says very clearly elsewhere, written, the God I, be uh, I believe in is Spinoza's God. He writes a poem to um, Spinoza, the great philosopher, who lived about 300 years ago, um, 200 to 300 years ago, in Amsterdam. He wrote the book Ethics, where he talks about a God. Why does Einstein say I believe in that God? Because it's not a God set apart from nature, not an anthropomorphic God somewhere else. It is God who is revealed in the impersonal workings of this vast universe. And Einstein writes, what is in common parlance called pantheism? God in this universe. Uh, not a personal deity involved in the day-to-day uh, lives of human beings. So I don't believe in that. This pantheistic God, if you actually study what uh, Spinoza wrote about in a very rational, his book is like a book of geometry with uh, axioms and de derivations from it, you know. So if you read about it, it sounds a lot like Vedanta. I would say the, the, it sounds a lot like Vishishtadvaita Vedanta. There's a one divine unity of which we are all parts. Um, Vishishtadvaita Vedanta is actually not pantheism. There are uh, subtle differences. And a more sophisticated version of that is Advaita Vedanta, non-dual Vedanta, which Vivekananda is going to talk about. I dare say if Einstein had read this lecture <laughs> uh, of Swami Vivekananda, he would have uh, been very, uh, very happy. He would have been delighted at this conception, which is probably a more refined conception of what Spinoza was talking about. So what is Swami Vivekananda's answer to this great problem of religion and renunciation? He says the answer is the deification of the world. And he quotes from the Isha Upanishad. The first verse of the first mantra of the Isha Upanishad. You know, the Upanishads are the root texts of Vedanta. And Isha Upanishad is one of the more well-known Upanishads. One of the smallest, only 18 mantras. One of the most important, and in the Isha Upanishad, the first mantra is the most important. In the first mantra, the first line is the most important. Mahatma Gandhi, 
Mahatma Gandhi, this year is also the 150th anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi said, if all of Hinduism were to disappear, all the books and temples and everything, just the first verse, the first line of the first verse of the Isha Upanishad remains, all of Hinduism would remain. It's that important. And Swami Vivekananda takes that as the solution to this problem of religion and renunciation. What is that, that mantra, the first, this grand opening mantra of the Isha Upanishad? Isha vasyam idagam sarvai yat kincha jagatyam jagat tena tyaktena bhunjitha magridha kasya swidhanam. Take the first line. What does it mean? This entire universe of moving and non moving beings, living and non living beings, all this universe. Cover it by God. Cover it by the Lord. Isha. Shankaracharya interprets Isha as Paramatma, as, as the Lord of, of this entire universe. Cover it by God. Swami Vivekananda says, not cover it with a false kind of optimism, trying to say, oh, it's all God. No, but he says, really open your eyes and see that it is indeed God. What we thought is the world is actually, when you seen in reality, it is God. In what sense? In the commentary on Isha Upanishad, Shankaracharya, 1400 years ago, writes a wonderful commentary. Um, he says, it's not so much a question of covering it with God, rather God, that ultimate reality which religion speaks about, exists right here. So it's not a question of covering so much as uncovering. And how do you uncover? You discover. So Covering is equal to uncovering is equal to discovering. How do you discover? Shankaracharya gives a rather convoluted example. Which, Anyway, let me tell you the example, but I'll, I'll go on later. The example he gives is, he says, Chandanu Agarvu Adi. He says, sandalwood, which is used in um, temple worship in, in Hinduism, now, there was, it used to come in blocks. And it seems, I don't know, but it seems that if, you, if it's kept in water, it develops a certain layer which has a foul smell. And the process was before you use it for the worship, you rub it and rub it. This is Swarupa Nigarshanena. By, by continuous intense rubbing, the layer, the artificial layer which had formed, incidental layer which had formed on top is rubbed off. And the natural, uh, and the, the natural fragr fragrance of sandalwood comes out. It's there. To get the, his point is to get the fragrance of sandalwood, you don't have to spray sandal spray on it. If you, <laughs> that's artificial. Whereas if you rub it, the real um, the inner inherent fragrance of sandalwood is manifested. Exactly in the same way, we are under error. And Shankaracharya points out something there. If it is true that Brahman alone is the reality here, Men and women and children and plants and animals and stars and planets, quasars and quarks. If it is in reality none other than this existence consciousness bliss at its core. If the universe is actually Brahman, then what about the universe that we seem to think it is? This world of living, non-living, men, women, children, good and bad and evil. It becomes, it necessarily becomes an appearance. What we thought was the reality, what we took to be the reality so far, in which we suffered, that becomes an appearance. It's not the ultimate reality. There is an underlying divinity which is the ultimate reality, which is to be discovered. Covered, uncovered, discovered. This whole idea of Jagat Mithya, the world is an appearance. This has to be understood properly. It, do, it's not, it does not mean dismiss this. Here itself is that divinity. So if you dismiss this and say that some other divinity is there, you have missed it. Uh -huh. Swami Vivekananda powerfully says, He who plunges headlong into the foolish luxuries of this world has missed the way. He who runs away from this world to meditate and die in a Himalayan cave and who hates the world, who scorns the world, he has missed the way. Both of them has missed the way. If you catch hold of this reality, you've missed the way. If you let go of this and run off somewhere else trying to find a God elsewhere, you've missed the way. But that's very strange. Either you take the world or you give it up. Well, where is the third option? 
Swami Vivekananda says, find God here, here itself. Wherever you are, with whomever you are with. There itself you can find God, it's because God is there. You know the example of the ornaments and gold. Suppose there are ornaments made of gold. So there's a nice story, there's very, many little stories which are used by the monks in the Himalayas to illustrate this point. One is the story of a, of a jeweler. Um, so he has a little son and the jeweler would keep all the, his, his materials and ornaments locked up in a safe. Once he tells his son, uh, my son, go to the safe, here's the key, open it and get some gold from there. I have to use it in my work. And the child runs off and he opens the safe and then he comes back and says, there's no gold. And his father says, what? There, there is, go and take a good look. Comes and says, no, there is no gold. What did you find? Well, there are necklaces and uh, uh, bracelets and tiaras, but no gold. His father says, look, what you think is a necklace, is a bracelet, is a tiara, is actually gold. So bring any of that, that'll do. Notice then. What the child thought was, there is some reality called gold which my father wants me to seek. And here are these things which are not, which are, this is of course a necklace, this is of course a bracelet, it can't be gold. The gold must be something apart from this, big mistake. Give it up, look for gold elsewhere, you'll never find it. Take the necklace itself to be gold? No. Because the moment the necklace is melted and made into a bracelet, you will think gold has gone. You see? That other story of the, um, of the man who goes to a pawn shop of a businessman who has fallen on hard days and goes to a pawn shop and gives his image of Ganesha to the <laughs> um, pawn shop owner and says, give me some money. And the pawn shop owner weighs the image and gives him some money. This is the rate at which I will give, give you money for the image of Ganesha. And you know, Ganesha comes with his ride, which is the, the mouse. So all the deities have their own vehicles. Durga has a much more glamorous vehicle, the lion. But Ganesha has a mouse. And the businessman says to the pawn shop owner, so that's, this is the money for Ganesha. How much for the mouse? And the owner, shop owner says that it's the same rate. Take it or leave it, it's the same rate. And this businessman is outraged. He says, what? Man, do you have no religion? You're giving the same rate for Ganesha as for a mouse. Is Ganesha and a mouse the same for you? And this shopkeeper says with a smile, Sir, look, for you it may be Ganesha, for you it may be a mouse. For me it's gold. And I wait and treat it accordingly. So there's an underlying reality. Yeah. If you toss away the, the whole of it, then you have missed God. If you take only the name and the form, then you're hold, holding on to samsara, not to God. So, seeing God in everything, Swami Vivekananda powerfully says, then what becomes of renunciation? Do you have to give up your husband and wife and children? No. To become spiritual? No, he says. Find God in the husband, in the wife, in the children. There's an old tradition in India of naming children, giving the names of gods and goddesses to children. That was the original uh, purpose, to remind you that it is a divinity right there. So find God in every person, with the people you're working with, in the living and the non-living, in the environment. It's not imagination. Vedanta says that it is that one reality, Satchidananda, with names and forms, which appears as this world before us. Now what happens to renunciation? The old teaching, give up the world if you want God. Notice, then there is a deeper meaning to renunciation. What is renunciation in this paradigm? It is to renunciation, true renunciation, the highest renunciation is to see God in everything. That itself is renunciation. The second line of the mantra, Tena tyaktena bhunjitha magridha kasya swidhanam. Protect this knowledge, this insight you have by renunciation. What does it mean? Once you get this insight, the Lord that I love, the divinity, God, is here in everything, in and through everything. Now live your life according to that. You see, what is the problem? 
Buddha found out long ago, 2,500 years ago, our real source of suffering, dukkha, is desire. Trishna, desire. I want. This is nice. This is good. I need it. Why? With that, my life will be fulfilled. And there are certain things which are bad and it's disturbing me. It's horrible. I want to get rid of this. I want to get hold of that desire. And once that starts, there is suffering. Now we understand why there should be suffering. Why is this wrong? Because it puts us in a false position. If it is the same reality everywhere, same Brahman, and this Brahman is Atman, you yourself. Shankaracharya in his commentary, he says, cover everything by the Lord. Isham, Isha means the Lord, means God. Cover everything by God. And then see how he tra transmutes the term. Isha means Paramatma. The soul of everything. Paramatma is your own Atma. Is your own own self. So cover everything by God. God alone is everything. What it means is, I alone am everything. Ahameva idam sarvam. I alone, my real nature, who I really am, that alone is expressed in all these ways. Now if I alone am expressed in all these ways, I am all of this. What could I want? I am that already. What will, it, what will it avail me if I shift some property from that body to this body? Because I am that one and this one too. From that point of view, from the Atman point of view. With this, this feeling of that universal self, I am the self in all. Then the whole question of particular desires to fulfill myself, it disappears immediately. That beautiful story of the princess of Kashi, where um, some of you know, there was a dramatic performance in the court of an ancient Indian king, and one of the characters was supposed to be the princess of Kashi, who was a little girl. Kashi, you know, Banaras, the holy city of the Hindus, so that was a character, uh, that was a role in the, in the drama. And the queen said, who will play that role? Well, the prince of that kingdom, he was five years old at that time, He's a cute little boy, you can dress him up as a princess and he can play the role. And that was done. And he looked so nice, the queen said, paint a portrait of the prince in the dress of the princess of Kashi. And that was done, a nice portrait was made and was signed and dated. Years later, when the prince grew up, maybe 15 years later, one day while exploring the palace, he goes to the cellar and among the old stuff he's rummaging around, he finds this old portrait. He rubs the dust of it and sees the princess of Kashi, looks at the date. Oh, she must be my age. She, 15 years ago, and she must be my age. And he falls in love with her. And he says, I must marry her, otherwise I'll never be happy again. But he's a little shy, he can't tell his parents. He mopes and uh, um, soon the father, the, prince, the king and the queen note that something is wrong with the prince, but he won't say. Finally, a wise old minister takes him aside and asks him, what ails the prince? Tell me. You can confide in me. And the prince says, I am in love. And the minister says, very good. Who is she? She is the princess of Kashi. Oh, princess, very good. You'll be a suitable uh, bride for you. Where did you meet her? I haven't actually met her, but um, I can show you her picture. And it's an old picture, um, painted 15 years ago. But anyway, she's uh, obviously my age. The minister said, wait a minute, old picture, 15 years ago. Where did you see this? Can you take me there? And the prince takes him to the cellar. This is the picture. And the uh, minister looks at it and says, prince, you need to sit down. <laughs> this is not the princess of Kashi. Well, whoever she is, I'll marry her. No. Then he tells the prince the whole story of the dramatic performance and how he was dressed up as a little kid as the princess of Kashi, how the portrait came to be painted, and says, Prince, that thou art, Tattvamasi. Now what happened to the prince's desire for the princess of Kashi? It disappears immediately. Why does it disappear? Because the princess is married off and he, he cannot have her anymore? No. Because the princess is dead? No. Because the princess does not exist? Not quite. He himself is that princess. He, forever, that princess and he were one and the same. There's really nothing other than him outside himself which he can get for his own fulfillment. He is that princess, is himself, and is ever fulfilled. 
This world is our princess of Kashi. This world is our princess of Kashi. The Isha Upanishad says, Magridhakasya Swidhanam, do not covet. For whose is wealth? Whose is wealth? That's the original uh, statement of the Upanishad. And commentators after commentators have interpreted that. They say, whose is wealth? A devotional approach to Vedanta will say, all wealth belongs to God. Whatever can be nice and desirable in the world belongs to God, not to us. Including our bodies and minds. So that's a, from a devotional approach. From a jnana approach, the knowledge approach, Shankaracharya comments, whose is wealth? What wealth is there apart from the Atman, the Self, Brahman? That alone appears as all wealth. What, where are the jewels apart from the gold? Where, are the pot, where is the pottery apart from the clay? Where are the waves apart from the ocean? Similarly, where is the universe apart from Brahman? What is there to be coveted? Because you are that Brahman, not part of it. There's no part and whole here. It's only one reality. And you are that entire one reality. What is there to be coveted? So, knowing this, now live your life. Seeing God in everybody, Vivekananda is eloquent there. Seeing God in happiness and in misery, the so-called happiness and misery, necklace and bangle, both two things made of the same gold. So, no, 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 Swami, misery is very nasty, happiness is nice. <laughs> but I tell you, when you see the underlying reality, when you see the same divinity underlying a, um, a, an unpleasant occurrence and the most pleasant thing, you will, you will have what is called samadrishti. Again, and samadrishti means an evenness of vision. The way it is translated, it sounds like an ophthalmic defect or something, you know, like short-sighted, even-sighted, they will translate it. Short-sighted, long-sighted, even. But what it means is, you see a oneness everywhere in this universe. Seeing that oneness, and that oneness you are. Seeing that oneness, the so-called good things of the world and the so-called miserable things of the world are neither so good anymore, neither so miserable anymore. You find a light in the worst of circumstances. You see the same constant light is shining. And in the most nicest of things, when good things happen, you find it is the same light appearing as that. A certain, from that comes real renunciation. You are no longer pursuing things the products of maya for your fulfillment. It can never fulfill you. Swami Vivekananda said, we are sitting near an ocean of nectar and dying of thirst. We are sitting next to heaps of food and dying of hunger. What we seek for fulfillment is right here within us. We don't see it at all. We mistake it again and again. What is the mistake? We see it as the world out there. I am this, that is the world. And the world has two faces, attractive, tempting, or fearful, terrifying. Tempting and terrifying. Swami Vivekananda said these things are dead in themselves. We breathe life into them, then we run towards them or we run away from them. <laughs> and that becomes samsara for us. Magridha kasya swidhanam. Do not covet wealth because whose is wealth after all? In fact, he says there is no wealth. There is what you consider to be attractive things. It's all like the princess of Kashi. It's an appearance of you yourself projected out there, a product of maya. Then how, do you, how does one live? How does one live in this world? What becomes of work, activities of the world? Do you have to give them up? Not at all. It is the enlightened person who can work. How the person in samsara, driven by hope and temptation, driven by fear and anxiety and the great fear of death, how can this person work really? Truly, it is the enlightened person, it is the sage and the saint who can do good work. Entirely working completely out of a sense of for fulfillment for the world, not for personal fulfillment. Personally always fulfilled, always happy. The next verse, the next mantra of the Upanishad, Kurvanne veha karmani jiji vishet shataggam samaha evang tvai nanya theto astina karma lipyate nare. Work in this way, seek to work in this way, seek to live a hundred years. So I'm Vivek on this translation. Seek to live a hundred years, a blessed life of happiness and fulfillment. Your whole life will be a blessing to the world around you. 
working in this way, seeing God in everything and thus working, uh, thus working, you will fulfill your life, be a blessing to others. And it is only in this way you will not be trapped by karma. Na karma lipyate nare. Otherwise what happens is, the law of karma works and traps us in samsara. Good, good, bad, bad. And none escape the law. That is the law of karma. When we see, our, when we see samsara, but when we see Brahman, that one reality within us, the divinity, then you escape from the law of karma. It does not touch you anymore. Here is an interesting thing. Shankaracharya wrote his famous commentary on the Isha Upanishad 1400 years ago. And Swami Vivekananda gave this talk in 1896. In the first mantra, it's very interesting, in the first mantra, the most important mantra, cover everything by the Lord, Isha Avasyam Idam Sarvam, Shankaracharya and Swami Vivekananda agree absolutely. In the second mantra, Swami Vivekananda and Shankaracharya disagree completely. I'll first tell you what is the traditional interpretation Shankaracharya has given. It's very interesting. What Shankaracharya has done is, the 18 mantras of the Isha Upanishad, he has neatly split into two parts. Upanishad itself has two parts. One part is for the one on the path of knowledge, the enlightened one. The one who is already enlightened or seeking enlightenment. Path of knowledge. The second part of the Isha Upanishad, according to Shankaracharya, is the conventional religious life. Good moral life. Yeah. Ethical moral life in the Vedic sense. So what Shankaracharya does is, up to now, whatever I've said, what Vivekananda says, Shankaracharya says the same thing 1400 years ago. Absolutely no disagreement. Divinize your life. See God in everything. And your life turns into a blessing. There itself is renunciation. Not actually giving up the jewels and looking for gold elsewhere. There itself, seeing the gold in the jewels. And Vivekananda is very clear. Have your prosperity. He would say, have your Manhattan. Have your jobs. Have your vacations. Have your cars. Whatever it is. But see the one divinity in that. Don't see that your fulfillment in this, don't those things and in the lack of those things you are unfulfilled. No, no, no. You are ever fulfilled. But coming to the second mantra, Shankaracharya says, Itarasya. He says, for those who are enlightened, that is the first mantra. For those who are seeking enlightenment, that's the first mantra. Itarasya, for others. Anatmagyataya. Not those who are not knowers of the real self, that I am Brahman, they don't know this. Atma jnana ashaktasya, who are incapable of knowing. Who are incapable of knowing. Idam upadishati mantra. These are the instructions. What are the instructions? If you are not walking on the path of enlightenment, if it does not appeal to you, if this world appeals to you, I will be happy here in this world. And after death, I will go to higher worlds, you know, Swarga, heaven. Then, what is the way? Then the way is there's another track, track two. <laughs> track one for the smart kids, track two for the rest. <laughs> track two is Kurvan Neveha Karmani, the same mantra. Performing all religious acts. Here, karma means Vedic religious acts, the fire sacrifice. Uh, the yajna, the fire sacrifice, the really, what, what a traditional religious Hindu would do in Vedic times. Performing those acts, seek to live out your full span of life. Be a religious person, ritualistic person, moral person. And in this way live your life so that at the end of your life you have this accumulated merit. You have good karma and a purified mind. And therefore, and then you will, and he interprets several mantras. He says, by following that path, you will go on to higher worlds and ultimately be ready for enlightenment also. You will go to and come to the same enlightenment, but you will take the scenic route. <laughs> you will live this life, maybe other lives, go to heaven, maybe multiple heavens, and ulti ultimately end up in what was called the world of the Brahma Loka, the world of Brahman, where you still retain an identity, but... You are now then on the fast track to enlightenment. There. How many lifetimes later we do not know. But that's, 
So this was called krama mukti, sequential path to sequential path to liberation. And this first mantra, seeing God everywhere, right here, right now, sadhyo mukti, instant liberation, here and now and forever. So I'll take the first one. Yes. <laughs> Shankaracharya says this mantra is meant for those who want the second path, and then he says the rest of the Upanishad. From mantra number three to mantra number eight. Mantra number three to mantra number eight is a development of Brahma Jnana. The, the teaching about I am Brahman, seeing Brahman in all beings. That teaching is developed in mantra number three to eight. And then again from mantra number nine to eighteen till the end of the Upanishad is the second path of Vedic ritualism and Vedic rites and a, a ritualistic religious lifestyle leading to higher worlds and, and, a, and a kind of moral religious life, not enlightenment. So that's how he divides it. That's what makes this Upanishad a difficult Upanishad. There is a sudden switch of, of, um, of tone suddenly in the middle of the Upanishad. What does Swami Vivekananda do? He interprets the entire Upanishad from beginning to end in the same tone. It's all about enlightenment. In notice, instead of saying that this is for the people, seeing God in everybody is for those who are seeking knowledge and enlightenment, the next one is for people who want to lead a conventional moral life. He says, no, no, seeing God in everybody, seeing God in everything, this is real renunciation. Now, with that God vision of seeing Brahman inside and outside, seek to live a blessed life. That is the interpretation of the second mantra. Whereas Shankaracharya makes a clean division there. This is not for you. You are all Vedanta society. Mantra one, fast track. <laughs> and for the rest of them out there, mantra two. <laughs> Suppose you say, that moral, ritualistic, religious lifestyle, most people out there are not interested. Then what happens? Then this is what happens is, is dangerous. Yeah. Then if you do not take recourse to mo um, morality and ethics, in today's world, nobody wants you to perform, uh, is asking you to perform fire sacrifices in Central Park. <laughs> but, um, but a moral, a religious, sec uh, uh, ethical lifestyle, if you do not do that, the next option is unethical lifestyle, uncontrolled lifestyle. And with the consequences, the law of karma will teach you then. The result of, uh, of an unrestrained, unethical lifestyle. So that is Shankaracharya's vision. Swami Vivekananda's vision is, the whole thing is one integrated uh, message. See God in everything and thus live your life. Very beautiful mantras are there. Uh, Swami Vivekananda gives a free translation of those. I can just imagine in London, 1896, interpreting the uh, free interpretation of the Isha Upanishad mantras. He says, the Upanishad talks about Anejadekam manaso javiyo nainat deva apnuvan purva marshat tad dhavato anyanatyeti tishtat tasminnapo matarishvadadhati This is the um, fourth mantra. It says that without moving, this Brahman, this existence, consciousness, bliss, without moving, it is faster than the mind. See, the whole, it's a very poetic way of putting it. This Upanishad is full of paradoxical language. But it's pointing to one thing. What does it point to? All our experiences are in Brahman, in consciousness and in existence. When it says, this Brahman, this Atman is faster than the mind, without moving it's faster than the mind. What does it mean? Whatever you can think of, whatever you think, feel, experience, you know, uh, perceive, remember, love, hate, all of the activities of the mind are in consciousness. That's what it means, that it is faster than the mind even without moving. Because whatever the mind does is within consciousness. Wherever the mind and the senses go, he says consciousness is already reached. It's, he sets up a race, the open here. The race between consciousness, mind and sense organs, which is faster? The eyes are faster, the mind is faster, or consciousness is faster. He says, bronze medal, the sense organs. <laughs> Silver medal, the eyes, uh, the, the, the mind. But gold medal, by far, consciousness. Yet the, yet the amazing thing is, 
the, the Atman, consciousness, does not race at all. It stands right there on the starting block and has won the race already. Tishtat. Tishtat, it is staying, it's staying put. The Atman stays put. Where can it go? It is all pervading. It's one reality. Taddhavato, the other sense organs are ru rushing forth. Eyes are going to their forms. Ears are going to sound. Tongue to the taste. Uh, they are rushing forth to their objects as if, just imagine a race. Five sense organs rushing to their objects. And the mind has already is faster because it has already conceived of those objects. It knows what it is. But all of that is possible because of this one all-pervading existence. The forms and the, the sound and the taste which your, the senses are rushing towards, do they not exist? Do they not share in existence? Then existence is already there. It is in consciousness that these objects and their senses appear. It is in consciousness that they are all experienced. So that's a philosophical way of putting it. The poetic and rather humorous way of putting it is it's a race. And in the race, consciousness always wins without racing. Tishtat, standing still. And then the Upanishad goes on. Tadejati tannejati taddure tadantike tadantarasya sarvasya Paradoxical language. It moves not. And it moves. It does not move. The Atman. And all movement is because of it. It is the closest of the close. It is further than the farthest. It is within everything. It is beyond everything. Paradoxical language. But what does it mean? It's actually very easy to understand what it means. If you take it from the Brahman, the Atman perspective, Tadejati Tannejati. It does, Ejati means to vibrate, to move. A company, to, to, to vibrate, to move, to shake. It does not move. It's absolutely the same all the time. Yet all movement, all action is due to it. Take the example of, say, electricity. Electricity, we know. The bulb is shining, the fans are going round and round, giving us air, the microphone is amplifying sound. Let me ask you, does electric electricity shine? Does it go round and round and give you air? Does electricity amplify sound? He will say no and yes. No, in itself electricity does not shine. In itself electricity does not go round and round and give you air. In itself electricity does not amplify sound. But, but... In association with that little device, the bulb, electricity certainly is shining there, through the bulb. In association with that device, electricity is certainly giving you air, going round and round, and magnifying sound, amplifying sound here. In the same way, that Atman, existence, consciousness, bliss, your nature, it does not walk, it does not talk, it does not say hello and shake hands, and yet, that same Atman, in association with the body and mind. It is the Atman itself who is walking around. It is the Atman itself who shakes your hand and, and uh, says hello. Who else is there? Another example. Do you wear, uh, uh, wear gold on your neck or on your bracelet or on your head? You will say, it depends. Gold in itself you don't wear anywhere. But if you make gold into a necklace, you can wear it on your neck. If you make it into a bracelet, you can wear it on your uh, wrist. Uh, as a tiara, you can wear it on your head. So with a particular name and form, gold fulfills all those functions. Not only gold fulfills all those functions, without gold, follow this carefully, without gold, can you wear a necklace on your neck, a golden necklace? No, it would disappear. You can't wear a bracelet or a tiara because they, would, they don't exist without gold. Similarly, Existence, consciousness, bliss, pure being, pure awareness, that Satchidananda, which is the Atman or Brahman, that alone appears as body and mind, all those things, as the car which is rushing along on the street, all those things which move and shake and vibrate, this entire madly whirling universe, that is that same Brahman with name and form and activity, Nama Rupa Vyavahara. Tadejati tannejati. It vibrates, it moves not. Taddure taddvantike. It is farther than the farthest, nearer than the nearest. Very simple explanation. You know how it works? 
It says, uh, Shankaracharya comments there, to the one who does not know it, it seems very far away. It seems very far away. I don't know where it is in which heaven, this so-called God. Or it's so theoretical, so abstract. Isn't it, Swami? We are right here. See, we are seeing, sitting in chairs. You are standing there and talking. Where is Brahman here? It's like saying, suppose you are in a dream. And you are uh, sitting and, talk, and listening to a Vedanta talk. It would be more, I don't know, a dream or nightmare, I don't know. <laughs> Another Vedanta talk. Is it still going on? <laughs> so, and somebody comes and tells you, it's a dream. No, here I am sitting. Here is the Swami talking. How can it be a dream? It's all your mind. Where is the mind here? It's a chair. I'm a body sitting here. There's a Swami. There is a microphone. And there's a hall. Where is the mind? And yet when you wake up, suddenly you sit up, maybe in a cold sweat, <laughs> on your bed. Then you realize, oh, that hall and those people and the Swami and all of it was in my mind. It was truly my mind appearing in all those forms, seeming to be... A, a waking, living, solid experience. Tadure, tadvantike. It seems very far away. To call this reality, to call it, it's a dream, it's a mind appearing in all these forms. What do you mean mind? It's a solid world. But it seems, it, you realize it's the mind when you wake up. Tadantike, it is closer than the closest, Shankaracharya says, to the one who knows it. It is closer than the closest. What is closest to you? This place? What is the, even closer? My clothes? What's even closer? My body? What's even closer? My thoughts? What's even closer? I, me, myself? Yes. Aham brahmasmi tattvamasi that thou art. If you truly knew yourself, Vivekananda would again and again say, if only you would truly know yourself, then everything would be solved. It is closer than the closest to the one who knows it. It's farther than the farthest to the one who does not know it. To one who does not know it, it sounds theoretical. It's not theoretical. It's more solid than the most solid thing. One of the ancient Vedantic texts says, where can the universe exist? If Brahman is the only reality, you know what kind of reality it is? It says it is more dense than the most dense rock. When we talk about consciousness, pure being, sounds abstract. He says, no, no, no. The universe is abstract compared to Brahman. Brahman is absolutely more concrete than concrete. It is so dense, there is not the slightest space there for the universe to exist. It is Brahman and Brahman throughout, God and God throughout. Where is the scope for a world to exist? What you think of as the world is an appearance of God. Tadantike. Tadantarasya sarvasya. It is within everything and yet beyond everything. Very easy to understand. Rope which is mistaken as a snake. Can't we say, where is the rope when you are seeing the snake which is not a snake? Where is the rope then? Where is the rope? Right there. Right there. Dr. Shah is saying, it's me. <laughs> yes, that's the, Vedanta, that's the correct Vedantic answer. I am Brahman, not a rope. <laughs> I am Brahman um, It's right there Where you are seeing the snake The rope is right there In fact What is the purpose Of saying the world is an appearance World is an illusion World is maya In Advaita Vedanta teaching What purpose does it serve Two purposes World is an appearance one purpose is, in spiritual life, one purpose is, it generates vairagya, dispassion. If it is not real, I don't want it. Right? If it's a dream, if it's a fiction. I dreamt I won a million dollars in the rot lottery. Nowadays it's a hundred million dollars. Powerball or something. I dreamt I won a hundred million dollars in the lottery. But Swami, I'm full of renunciation. I give you that hundred million dollars. Donation to Vedanta Society. Why? Because it's not real. I have no attachment to it. I can give away as much as I want. That which is not real has no pull on us. No matter how attractively it's dressed up, if it is not real, it becomes the princess of Kashi. So, that is the first purpose. 
but real masters of vedanta t- t- tell you that you know hindi they will say jagat mithyatva vairagya ke liye hai ye to kacche vedanti bolte hain that the purpose of the teaching of the falsity of the world is to generate vairagya dispassion this is the teaching of of um, superficial vedanti of uh, of those who are don't really who are not really well versed in vedanta the real purpose of the f- teaching of the falsity of the world you know what it is it's dramatic the real purpose is pointing out where brahman is where is god where is brahman where is that ultimate reality where is the rope there itself where you are seeing the snake what you think is the snake when you awaken to it you will see it's the rope what you think is the world and samsara and good and evil when you awaken to it you will see it's god through and through always was always will be not after enlightenment even now even when we are not enlightened we think we don't know but even now it's that one sadhu in uttarakhand is to i still remember in we sit at his feet and study old monk more than 80 85 at that time huge punjabi sindhi Uh, he came to the uh, himalayas at the during the partition of india 1947 so straight he came from sindh and st- uh, across india to the himalayas and stayed there for the last 50 60 years anyway i still remember he, he had a big face looking down at me and chuckling and saying well mahatma ji well swami what a strange teaching whether you know it or not whether you accept it or not you are god तो महात्मा जी ये बड़ी उल्टी सिद्धांत है तुम जानो या ना जानो तुम मानो या ना मानो तुम ही राम यू आर यू आर नन अदर दिन गॉड वेदर इवन इफ यू डोंट एक्सेप्ट इट यू डोंट हैव टू बिलीव इन इट फॉर इट टू बी ट्रू यू डोंट हैव टू बी अ हिंदू ओ वट अ कोइंसिडेंस टूडे इज राम नवमी तुम ही राम इन दिस कॉन्टेक्स लेट मी से um something that swami vivekananda pointed out in that lecture itself very important so in this way see god in everything and then he says or if you cannot or if you cannot see god in one thing and then go on from there see god in one thing just one line he has added there the whole of bhakti shastra the way of devotion is hidden in that line if it is too much for me to ask me to see god in um, in my boss or in my poodle <laughs> <laughs> swami god in the dog it's dog d o g not g o d how can i see <laughs> just the opposite it's too much then swami vivekananda says then see god in one thing love and revere and worship that one thing and then go on from there what is that one thing the personal god Uh, the god of uh, the christians the god of the jews the god of the muslims um, vishnu and shiva and um, uh, devi the, the divine mother or the incarnations of this personal god like rama like krishna or christ or or ramakrishna and have reverence faith that here is divinity it's much easier in one sense some some mentalities find it much easier why because such wonderful qualities are there they are divine they are all loving merciful endlessly wise and compassionate uh, and especially in the case of the incarnations like buddha or rama or krishna or christ ramakrishna they are historical figures uh, in some sense they are especially in sri ramakrishna's case absolutely fully documented so it it feels real to us for that mentality then worship god find god in one thing and then go on the whole of dualistic religion uh, of devotional approach is there i'm reminded of gopal's mother the old lady who is to widow who used to come to sri ramakrishna she worshiped krish the god as the, the baby krishna gopala in an image she starts with that then experiences as a vision of gopal it becomes a living experience and she is flooded with ecstasy and devotion and then goes on she finds that same gopal everywhere then she finds gopal in everything in everybody and she calls everybody gopal she used to call sri ramakrishna gopala and when she comes and tells sri ramakrishna i see this um what should i do now should i continue with my practices repeating the name of krishna and all and he gives a very beautiful sweet advice he says you don't need to do anything anymore mother 
you have attained everything. But for the welfare of Gopala, keep on your spiritual practices. Repeat the mantra. Now you're doing it for the good of God, not for your own good. And that's interesting. Once Sri Ramakrishna put her in debate with Narendranath, Vivekananda, who was rational, you know, um, who did not ac uh, accept all these uh, God with you know, forms and images and things like that. And this simple old lady said how she sees God everywhere and, and everybody uh, and, with, and tells Narendra. And Narendra is supposed to take the skeptical side. By the time she has finished, Narendra is in tears. And the lady simply asks, my child, is it true? Or is it just, um, you know, my hallucination? I'm just maybe hallucinating. And Narendra says, no mother, it is all true. What you have seen is true. What you are seeing is true. Start with one, you will end up with the same thing, seeing God in everything. Now, taddure tad tadantarascha sarvasya, it is within all. And, tadu sarvasya asya bahyata, it is beyond everything. Why is the teaching of, of the snake and the rope, that the, the, it, the snake is false, not only it removes your fear of the snake, but it points out where the rope is, right where the snake is. Where is the gold? Right where the tiara or the uh, necklace is. Where is the water? Right where the wave is. Where is God? Right here. In the man, in the woman, in the husband, in the wife, in the son, in the daughter, in uh, friends, and in, even in so-called enemies, in living and non-living, in the high and mighty, and in, in the low and despised. It is one divinity everywhere. And one can actually see this. Then it is done. Liberation, sadhyo mukti, enlightenment and liberation here and now. Why don't we see it? Why don't we see it? The Upanishad itself says, third mantra of the Upanishad. Asurya namate loka andhena tamasavrita tagumste pretya bhigachanti yekecha atmahano janaha. The mantra means, those who do not know this, ignorance, it is hidden by not knowing. They go to the demonic worlds, Asurya Namate Loka. What are they like? They're covered in blinding darkness, Andhena Tamasavrita. After death, you, these souls, they go on to such worlds, the demonic worlds. What is the demonic world? It is nothing other than the world we are living in. The world of not knowing God. And Swami, I'm fine. You know, I can, I'm okay. It's not a demonic world. It's Manhattan after all. It's nice. <laughs> yes. But what it means is this cycle of birth and death. This coming to this life and growing up and then um, pursuing things in life. Getting something, being frustrated in other things. Then aging, decaying, dying and then leaving this stage of life. Whether victorious or defeated, we know not, and it goes on. And Swami Vivekananda would say, and this is Maya. The Upanishad says, this is the demonic world. Being whirled on from thing, one thing to another thing to another thing. It was in a seminar recently. It was a seminar on the unknown. And the uh, different people, physicists, mathematicians, philosophers, um, uh, Psychologists, historian. So the historian said, what is the, what is the definition of history? He said, the best definition of history is it's one damn thing after another. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true, of <laughs> that's true of individual life also. One thing after another. This goes on. To what end? To what fulfillment we know not. A sensitive soul notes it very quickly. And then the first reaction is despair. First reaction is, like Kamu said, the only important philosophical question is, why should I not kill myself? The myth of Sisyphus, first line. Why should I not kill myself? You might think that's a bit, little too dramatic. But a sensitive soul will feel it. That What's the point of it? There is a point. The reality there. So that, that Swami said, that um, the teacher said, Right here, what you think is the world, what you think is terrible, 
right there is the reality that is the deeper teaching why we say the world is false to create vairagya dispassion point 1 but the deeper reason is to point out god directly if this is false the false cannot exist without the real a false snake must have a basis in a real rope so the reality is right there brahman is right there where where you are looking smelling tasting touching what you are thinking all that we think is samsara in ignorance is brahman in knowledge then what is the way out what is the way out swami vivekananda says it is all good to talk about this he says from my childhood i have heard that all is god but it really is not helping so much what is the problem as we go out into life a few knocks then all is god is forgotten i go out into life and there's a man approaching and i think ah here is god coming in this form and he punches me in the nose figuratively or verbally or whatever or really and all idea of god goes away and the blood rushes to my head and i <laughs> retaliate with two punches so, so what happened what happened to all this is god um, shankaracharya in his introduction to the brahma sutra of bhashya is one of most profound essays on vedanta it's called adhyasa bhashya the commentary on superimposition there he says practically speaking even see, people in even he says those who are well versed in vedanta in day to day action he says pashwadi avishesha there is no difference between them and animals and then he gives an example uh, he says as a cow harita trinapurna if you take green juicy grass and hold it in front of the cow and the cow is attracted it comes to eat the grass and then he says danda udyatakara with a raised stick if you threaten the cow the cow runs away thinking it's going to be beaten exactly like that temptation and tribulation and trials we all most human beings are attracted towards what it seems at the moment pleasant and nice and scared away by what seems terrible and scary that is samsara it's because of ignorance what vedanta says is a very high ideal but just because it's a high ideal does not mean it's false it's true right now does not mean it's impractical it's practical right now swami vivekananda says it's a high ideal and then one of his famous quotes which we have quoted often it's in this lecture he says if a man with a ideal makes a hundred mix, uh, makes 10 mistakes a man without an ideal will make 50000 mistakes is always better to have an ideal the higher the better pursue it he says we this atman is to be heard about reasoned about meditated upon shrotavya mantavya niridhyasitavya again and again tell yourself read about it hear about it there is these highest truths that's why so many upanishads and so many texts are there if you get bored the same we show upanishad again all right here is the kena upanishad here is the chandogya oh, i have read all the upanishad here is the bhagavad gita <laughs> and then there are so many so many texts and this truth is found in the core mystical traditions of all religions all over the world so hear about this again and again in a hundred different ways sing about it talk about it express it in worship in philosophy think about it reason it out and once you have got clarity live not just meditate upon it try to live life according to it and uh, what seemed difficult and impossible at first very soon very soon it becomes much easier and giving great joy as it becomes much easier you don't have to wait until you become a brahma gyani enlightened person liberated while living um, jivan mukta no even before that to the extent that we practice to that extent we are saved sri krishna says swalpam apyasya dharmasya trayate mahato bhayat even a little practice of this teaching saves one from great fear saves one from great fear that monk i told you about who said whether you know it or not whether you accept it or not you are rama the one in the himalayas he was sick he was old at that time and they called a doctor now this monk uh, he is a huge well built pan- punjabi and he was overweight at that time and he was sitting in this chair and the doctor comes and says swami what do you eat you are so you become so fat and the monk replied i'll tell you in english and then the original hindi he said doctor the doctor was skinny so, the doctor i i eat up 
all my worries and tensions. You know, junk food, so I am fat. And the worries and tensions are eating you up. You're so scared. <laughs> in uh, Hindi, actually he said it in Hindi. Dr. Sahab, hum chinta ko chaba jate hai, aur chinta aap ko chaba jati hai. There's an old Sanskrit saying, chinta means anxiety, worry, tension. What is worry, tension? In Manhattan, you're surrounded by it all the time. That's the staple food here. There's an old Sanskrit verse, chinta chita iti samakhyata. Chita in, in um, Indian languages means the funeral fire. When a Hindu dies, the body is cremated. So it says, Anxiety or tension is called a funeral fire. Chinta chita iti samakhyata. Chinta chita topi adhika. Tension or, or anxiety is worse than the funeral fire. Chita, uh, chita mritam hi daihyati. The funeral fire burns up the dead. <laughs> and you know the rest. Whereas anxiety burns up the living. Jivitam hi daihyati chinta. Dahati chinta. So, I burn up all anxieties. This is the result. This is the result of, uh, of this. Uh, so Swami Vivekananda, he quotes from the um, sixth and seventh mantras, very beautiful mantras of the Upanishad. It goes like this. Yastu sarvani bhutani atmeva nupashyat atmanye vanupashyati Sarvabhutastham chatmanam tato navijigupsate. The one who sees all beings in one's own self. Everybody is in me. And I am in all beings. I am in all beings. Atmanam sarvabhutastham chatmanam. And doing thus, two results come. The word vijigupsate in Sanskrit has two meanings. One is does not hate. Cannot hate. Literally, how can you hate? You can never hate your own children. They're very close to you, the closest. And here, these are your very Atman, your very self. So they are one with you. There's no question of hating. Another thing, another meaning is, does not protect. So there is no desire in the enlightened one to protect this single person. You know, we, are, we, we devote so much of our energy First of all, to physical protection of this body. Why? Why? I am this one. Can you really protect it? No. In the Bible itself, who can with all our efforts, with all efforts, add one day to one's span of life? Grass of the fields, here today and gone tomorrow. That's our life. You cannot protect it. Jesus was absolutely on, on target when he says, those who try to save their lives, they will die. And those who give up their lives for me, they get eternal life. What does it mean? He speaks in that language, but the meaning is very clear in Vedanta. Those who give up their life for me means what? You commit suicide? No. You realize that Brahman alone is the reality. My own reality is Brahman, not a body. Let the body go, nothing to me. It will go anyway. Then we seek not only to protect the body, but to protect our personalities, our egos. We seek to protect our image. Psychoanalysts know this. A great deal of psychic energy. Freud noticed it. Jung noticed it. A great deal of psychic energy is used to present a facade to the world. What I think of myself and what I want you to think of me, to present that, I put a lot of energy into it. One sign of enlightened persons is just the opposite. They really do not care what you think of them. Not that they have a contempt for you. They are absolutely full of love for you. And what you think of them, they're perfectly all right. They, they really don't think of themselves. There's a funny story about Ramana Maharshi. Somebody wrote an article criticizing him and sent a copy to him. And Ramana Maharshi read through it very carefully, corrected the grammatical mistakes and spelling mistakes <laughs> and sent it back. Somebody said, but he's criticizing you, Maharshi. And Ramana Maharshi said, no, he's criticizing some fellow called Ramana. <laughs> he's so impersonal, he has no connection with this. No, no question of trying to protect oneself. Well, it sounds like a terrible way of living. That's the most wonderful way of living. Most wonderful. 
you will see the great freedom, like an enormous burden falls off your, off your head. When you, in devotion, you put it at the feet of the Lord, or in jnana, you say, I am one with the Lord. What can kill you? What can harm you? Let the world say what it will. The world is nothing but you. Let them say. What will they think about me? Don't worry, nobody really thinks about you. <laughs> People are really full of their own lives. Once in a while they may think about you, not much. <laughs> Neither the praise of the world is important, nor the criticism of the world is important. So, this oneness. Yasmin sarvani bhutani atmeva bhut vijanata tatra komo hakka shoka ekatvam manupashyataha where the entire world becomes the self, the universe becomes the self. Tatra komo, what delusion is there? Delusion means, I am this much, that is different. Samsara and I, no. It is oneness. Tatra komo, kashoka, where is suffering anymore? Where is sorrow, where is the sting of sorrow and suffering? It's all gone. For whom? Ekatva manupashyata, the one who sees oneness here. We are all one, one divinity everywhere. Swami Vivekananda in his talk he says, this is the great theme, team, t- uh, teaching of Vedanta. This oneness of all existence. All is one existence and that one existence you are. So this is to be realized. Um, he goes on, it's very interesting to read that, the rest of that talk. Because the other verses of the Upanishad, starting from 9 to 18, which are entirely interpreted by Shankaracharya in terms of Vedic ritualism, are interpreted by Vivekananda in terms of the life of an enlightened person. I'll just give one short example and then end. There is a particularly difficult verse comes up next, when Shankaracharya makes a sharp break. Up to this is the teaching about Atman. Finished. If you cannot, ashaktasya, those who are un- incapable of this, come here. Uh, I'm giving you not the fast track. <laughs> the, the general route for everybody is the scenic route. Now that starts. And there's a big break there. Very beautiful verses which end, which end that teaching on the Atman. Um, Sapariyagat shukram akayam avranam asnaviragam shuddham apapavidham kavir manishi paribhu swayambhu yatha tatyato arthan vyadadhat shashvati bhya samabhya Beautiful. What does it mean? I'll give a running translation. Vivekananda also gives the running translation. That reality, Atman, your reality, is all pervading. Is beyond the physical body. It's not a body, physical body. It's not a mind, subtle body. It's beyond the causal body, ignorance also. It is um, shukram, which is pure consciousness. It is beyond good and bad. That is dharma, dharma, which is beyond the law of karma. Apapavidham. The original Sanskrit is not, not struck by sin. The sinless self. Kavi. Kavi literally means poet. But the ancient Upanishad, Kavi was a reference to the Rishis. And Kavi ultimately means Brahman, the ultimate reality of this universe. In the Rig Veda, you find a beautiful um, expression. Pashya Devasya Kavyam. Look upon the poetry of the Lord. I heard it first from a monk in the Himalayas, about 10,000 feet up, surrounded by snow peaks and Devadar forests. And the Ganga, the Ganges running several hundred feet below, rushing in a little torrent. Stunning, picturesque. And a little hut where the Swami was sitting. First time I heard this, he threw his arms like this and showed me this vast panorama, range after range of mountains, snow-covered. It was summer, the peaks were snow-covered. And those are the real giants. Um, going out to as if to infinity and the vast blue sky above and surrounded by pine forests, by uh, Devadar forests. And he says, look upon the poetry of, of the Lord. Pashya Devasya Kabhyam, Yona Jiryati Namamara, which neither decays nor dies. What is the poetry of the Lord? It is the universe. So Kavi, Manishi, the one controller of all our minds. And because of that Lord, 
the law of causality functions. I'm summarizing, it's a long verse. So all this works, all, this, all of it, it works because of the existence of that divine. And then there's a big change. The second part of the Upanishad kicks in, as it were, according to Shankaracharya. So for example, where is the difficulty? The difficulty is this. The Upanishad says, next, very mysteriously, and there are multiple commentaries on this. In the very ninth verse it says, those who are dedicated to avidya, ignorance, they enter into darkness. Those who are dedicated to vidya, knowledge, they enter into greater darkness. But combined, combining ignorance with knowledge, avidya and vidya, by ignorance one overcomes death, by knowledge one gets immortality. Ninth, tenth, eleventh words, mantras. What does it mean? And if you are puzzled, you are in good company. <laughs> centuries after centuries, so many commentaries were produced. I remember approaching um, a very revered monk of our order, Swami Prabhanandaji, who is now the vice president, uh, saying that, oh look, Swami Vivekananda says this. The first time I discovered this, I was a young monk. And Shankara says this. And he chuckled and he said, and I have got 11 other commentators who say 11 other things also. <laughs> what does Shankara say? Shankara gives a, an explanation which made very good sense if you look at the Vedic context in which he was saying it. But today it seems strange to us. It seems uh, we can't relate to it. What he says is, avidya, ignorance, ignorance is not the right term for avidya. Avidya means Vedic rituals. <laughs> and vidya means Vedic meditation. So those who are dedicated only to ritualism, they enter into darkness. Those who give up the rituals and only dedicate themselves to Vedic meditation, they enter into greater darkness. What does it mean? He says, not that they enter into darkness or greater darkness. This whole thing is a call for combining rituals and meditation. Avidya and Vidya. And rituals there stands for a Vedic lifestyle. So look at the language. By these rituals you overcome death. What is death? He interprets death as an immoral life. Now it begins to make sense. By a moral religious lifestyle you overcome an immoral unrestrained lifestyle. And by a higher spiritual practices based upon a moral life you go to immortality. But there he, by immortality he means the higher worlds. The path to the scenic route. So this is how he interprets it. What does Swami Vivekananda say? He says, the one who plunges into the foolish luxuries of this world, van vanities of this world, that is avidya, ignorance. He takes it literally as this world and says, this is all that there is and I will enjoy this. He enters into darkness, suffering. And the one who gives up all this, who scorns the world and retreats into a cave, thinking of finding something beyond. That person also, he says, misses the way. That is going into another kind of darkness. But he who, Swami Vivekananda says, understands nature, understands the working of nature, the law of karma, using the law of karma to transcend the law of karma, attains to the Atman immortality. Now this interpretation, you can see now, they're not entirely different, but... This one, what Vivekananda gives us, is more relevant to us. I mean, we relate to it directly. And so on, Vivekananda, he goes on. Even the last verse, which is very beautiful. Uh, there, Hiranmayena patrena satyasya pihitam mukham. The, the face of truth is hidden by the golden disk of the sun. That is the poetic expression. As if there is a reality, but there is a shining light which covers the reality. What is the shining life? Samsara. Right behind it is the reality. And the prayer is, the Rishi is praying to the sun. Withdraw, vyuha rashmin, samuha teja. Withdraw your blinding brilliance. Let me see the truth which is behind thee. With the yo sao purusha, soha masmeti. The reality behind this universe is the reality within me. And Vivekananda says, this is the reality which the Upanishad points towards. In the, uh, the Shanti Mantra, the introductory prayer to the Upanishad, it's a famous one. That is infinite, this is infinite. 
from that infinite, this infinite has come. Recognizing that infinite in this infinite, the infinite alone remains. Purnamadaha Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Parnamastu